So good morning everyone. My name is Darla Saunders and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation and the Canadian Rivers Institute, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. The series is made possible in part thanks to the contributions of the Government of Canada. So we are very, very happy today to be hosting Todd Dupuy. Todd has worked in the watershed restoration field for more than 20 years. He's a technical advisor for community-based watershed restoration projects and a lecturer of biology courses at University of Prince Edward Island. Todd is currently the executive director of the regional program with the Atlantic Salmon Federation and is based on Prince Edward Island. So uh, uh, just a few quick housekeeping matters for those of you who are new to this webinar series. Um, we're going to save questions for Todd until the very end of the presentation. To ask a question, you can use your webinar control panel, which is the little gray box that you should be seeing in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. If that box is minimized, you can hit the orange arrow to make it larger. Um, if you are signed in with a headset and using the audio of your computer, you can raise your hand, which is the little yellow icon, has a green arrow on it, and we can unmute you at the end of the presentation. Um, so that you can ask a question, or you can simply type in your question on the control panel, and I will read it aloud uh, for you to Todd. So I will now turn the webinar over to Todd. Thank you, Darla, and uh, thanks to the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation and to the Canadian Rivers Institute for hosting me. Uh, I think this is a great process. I did do a, a webinar last year, and I have been online to look at some of the webinars uh, that were given in the past, and they're great quality and uh, and I certainly enjoy doing that. Um, so we'll get right into it. I'm going to talk mostly about uh, my experience in uh, in Prince Edward Island. I'm actually parked in, in Charlottetown here, but I have some experience in some of the other Atlantic Canadian provinces with respect to uh, river restoration and fish passage, but today we're going to talk about, for the most part, uh, stuff that I've been involved in here. PPI. So the first topic we're going to talk about is, is fish passage, and so we're going to focus today on uh, trying to get fish up through, um, uh, through culverts. This is not uh, a picture from PEI, but it um, you know, shows you some of the issues that uh, fish can face. This is a particular uh, culvert that, uh, that's what we call hung or perched. Uh, this is a, a particularly bad example, uh, but um, I'll go back here. Hmm, okay, we've missed a, missed a slide. Let me go back here one here. Make sure I have the right uh, presentation on here. Okay, that's good. Okay, so we're going to talk about really four issues when it comes to uh, culverts. One is uh, what we call perch culverts or hung culverts. The ones have an excessive drop on the outlet of the, of the culvert. Uh, some that have high velocity water within the culvert. So it's one thing to get the fish up to the culvert. It's another thing to get them uh, through the culvert. And often uh, some of these culverts have high velocities that fish uh, can't negotiate. Uh, some culverts have a uh, water depth problem, and water depth problem uh, usually means uh, shallow water. And uh, some of these culverts also have what we call rotted floors. So the first uh, first one that uh, we're going to look at is actually these, it, it's perch culvert, also called hung culverts. This is an extreme example here. Uh, for obvious reasons, uh, you know, fish are going to have a, a problem negotiating uh, passage through this culvert for two reasons, because it's uh, you have to jump a long way to get up in here, and secondly, uh, the water velocity in here is likely uh, too much for most fish that we, uh, that we have here in, in Canada to negotiate. Uh, this is a, an extreme example. Uh, here's a, you know, more likely here to see uh, examples like this. This is not PPI, by the way. This is uh, uh, two culverts on the St. Mary's River in in Nova Scotia, and these are what we call hung culverts or perch culverts. And uh, so we've got, you know, water drop of, uh, you know, you're looking at two two feet anyway uh, in most of these cases, and that is enough, certainly enough to to block a lot of the fish species that uh, that would uh, be looking to migrate up into, into the spawning ground. So if you're looking at brook trout or uh, rainbow smelt or, or gaspero species or even Atlantic salmon, sometimes will have uh, have problems negotiating these uh, these these uh, these perch culverts. Velocity barriers, as I mentioned before, is another uh, another issue. Um, I, I can't run video in this process because it doesn't work. But if you look closely, you, you can tell that this water is really ripping through these culverts. And this in this particular case here, the water is going uh, in this direction here, and it's going so fast. There's actually a standing wave here where the water actually kind of curls back on itself. 
Uh, and this is, you know, this culvert is probably 50 or so meters long. So that's a long stretch of water for, uh, for fishing to go shade bass water. The same situation here, you can see there's wet water here, and this, this is a longer culvert. And uh, so if the water is moving very fast, it's, a, it's certainly unnatural for, uh, for fish to negotiate uh, to, to, to uh, you know, to uh, come up into a river system and find water uh, moving this fast for a long distance so they can't negotiate. Now often you can see these, uh, these culverts that have constrictions in them. Uh, actually what, what happens is as the water comes through the culvert, when it comes out the other side, it actually does a, what we call a, a counter current in both directions. So this is downstream of the culvert. If you stand looking down at the culvert, you'll notice that there's uh, debris and, and bubbles in the water that actually are doing a counter current on either side of, uh, of the culvert. And in high flow, what happens is that this counter current actually erodes the bank on either side of the culvert. So you get this big, wide pool, deep pool on the downstream side of the culvert. We call them culvert onions. And when you see them, uh, you know uh, for certain that these things are hydro hydraulically undersized uh, for fish passage. And if you go onto Google Earth, Google Earth or any aerial uh, photography, you'll, you'll see them everywhere. Here's, this is the river that I live on here in PEI. It's the West River, and uh, this is the downstream portion of the culvert here. And you can see how how wide the river is, and, and you know the river really should be should be uh, should be this big. And what's happening is the water's coming ripping through the culvert and doing this uh, this counter current thing. It's actually eroding the bank. Another one down here. This is a this is a, a big pond here. The water's going in this direction, but you'll notice below the bridge, uh, sorry below the culvert, you'll see this big area here, which, which we call culvert onion. And look how big the river really should be down here. It's very narrow. So, And that's just basically a reflection of how much energy uh, is coming through the culvert in high flow and the fact that the water is doing this back. And you can throw sticks in the water. You can see them doing this counter current. And that, uh, that causes uh, uh, the banks to erode. So when you see that, you know that uh, certainly this is a hydraulically undersized uh, or fish passage. It may be sized big enough to handle a 1 in 50 year rain event uh, so the, well, the road won't wash out, uh, but certainly for fish passage it's, it's undersized. Now the issue is um, in high flow and fast flow, um, these fish that, we, uh, that migrate up through rivers uh, are designed to negotiate these fast flow uh, because often uh, these, this fast flow is, is, is in amongst rocks and if you see rapids or uh, what have you with a stony bottoms creek often the water is actually actually as it comes down around the rock it actually comes back on itself in both directions anybody that's doing any whitewater kayaking or whitewater canoeing knows this uh, that as the water comes around the stones it actually will come back on itself and it creates a bit of a dead zone behind there and fish, fish of course know this they can hide in amongst these rocks and uh, actually get a boost going upstream because the water is actually going upstream here so what they do is in, in, in rapids, a uh, whitewater situation, they actually just go from rock to rock. Uh, instead of you know spending a lot of time swimming against the current, they just negotiate these fast-flowing uh, areas by going from rock to rock where there's actually breaks in the current. And if you look at a, uh, a, a actual piece of, of, of white water, you, uh, what's happening here is that there's a certain proportion of that water that's actually moving upstream. So all these stones here are causing the water to come up and upstream here and vice versa here. So in, in, in any given stretch of white water, there could be as much as 25 or 30 percent of the water that's actually moving upstream. And that's really how fish negotiate uh, these, these, uh, these rapid areas. Unfortunately, in culverts, uh, when you have a fast flow like this, you don't have any breaks in the current. So that's why these fish are having a hard time negotiating, uh, getting up through these culverts. Another issue, uh, which is not common, is, uh, is inadequate uh, water depth on PEI. And uh, usually these culverts are undersized, but in this particular case, this culvert is, uh, is actually oversized. And as a result, in low flow in the summertime, we're getting dry areas here and very shallow water in the culvert. And uh, uh, in this particular case, uh, the water is coming down both sides of the culvert uh, you know, very fast, so there'll be a velocity barrier there and very shallow, so it's, it'd be difficult to fish uh, to uh, to negotiate that fast flow. Uh, another issue, uh, a lot of the culverts of PEI are, have, um, have wooden floors. And these uh, culverts are, uh, were built usually you know, 30 or 40 years ago. We, often the floors are made of spruce. They are not treated. 
and uh, as a result they have a limited lifespan. Usually about 30 years or, or 35 years they start to, uh, start to rot and whereas the water used to be on the surface of the, of the floor of the culvert is now falling down and gets underneath the floorboards and causes some real issues with this passage. You look closely down here you'll see that there's a, there's a whole uh, school of rainbow smelt. These are rainbow smelt, uh, an anadromous fish on, on PEI there that uh, come in from salt water into fresh water to lay their eggs and of course when they, when they encounter something like, uh, something like this and this certainly would be a blockage, uh, blockage to fish passage. So governments are often reluctant to, uh, to replace these culverts because of uh, budgetary issues. If, unless, unless a culvert is, uh, is, is going to wash out uh, often they're reluctant to replace them because it's quite exp expensive uh, to replace them. So we've come up with some solutions in the interim uh, while we're waiting for these culverts to be replaced. Uh, we've uh, come up with some possible solutions to try to assist fish getting up, um, up through culverts. So we'll start with the first one, uh, which is the perch culvert or the hung culvert problem. In this particular case, uh, we build what we call riffle, riffle building. So in this particular case, we've got a uh, got a waterfall coming out of the culvert that may be, who knows, uh, a foot or two high, and we want to reduce that uh, that outfall. And what we do is we build a couple of dams downstream. So what we do, we instead of an outfall of a couple of feet, we may have three or four of these uh, little riffle structures that are maybe six inches high, uh, which are uh, would provide for better uh, passage for for fish. And I'll give you an example here. So we have a culvert here. That has a it, that is perched. Uh, it may only be uh, you know 15 or 20 centimeters, but in a lot of cases, uh, if it's a non-salmonid, non-trout, non non-salmon uh, non type of uh, fish, it, it's difficult for these things to these fish to negotiate. We're talking about you know uh, blueback herring. We're talking about uh, elwives or, or smelts. Uh, these fish are, are not as strong as some of the salmonid uh, species, and, and this this would be uh, enough for them to. Uh, to not get up into the culvert. So what we do is we, we often will build these ripple structures and, and instead of one big waterfall, we have two or three smaller waterfalls so they can negotiate uh, getting up into the culvert. This is an example. This is, a, it, it's, this is only about six or eight inches high. It's fairly close to salt water. It is an issue for smelts. So this is uh, the river that I live on here in, in PEI. So what we did is we, uh, we, we actually built these ripple structures. This is just a shot of a culvert in the background. You see there's a bit of a waterfall. And we put in these big anchor stones uh, in place downstream. You see there's a difference in the head, head of water here. And uh, we, in, in behind these anchor stones, we place smaller stones. So we're actually forcing the water to go up and over the structure as opposed to going through the rocks. And actually it causes a bit of a dam effect. And when you build a couple of these, uh, you can actually drown out the waterfall uh, so that fish can negotiate. So there's a before shot, there's an after shot of the same culvert. There's actually more than one of these uh, ripple structures. This is just one you see here, but there's two or three of these downstream. So what we basically did was to, instead of having one big waterfall, we've got two or three of them and that's the, then those fish are better able to negotiate uh, passage up to, uh, up to the culvert. Another one here, this is just a small structure. Uh, we only put one ripple structure in place. Uh, there was a, uh, an, this is an old, an old culvert, uh, the, the outfall out of the culvert was uh, about 6, uh, 15 centimeters higher than it is here, and it was causing problems for smell skin up there. So we decided to build one structure. You can see there's a difference in, in water level between here and there. We took about, oh, 10 or 12 centimeters out of this waterfall by creating this ripple structure down here. And these ripple structures are, uh, uh, fish are able to negotiate, negotiate getting up through there. So with these, and uh, we've reduced the outfall enough that fish can actually get into the culvert. Uh, here's another one. This is not a culvert, but it's an old dam site uh, and on Piscuit River in PEI. And this is an old concrete structure. It used to be an old mill dam for uh, running the sawmill that was removed years ago. But there was a sort of a remnant concrete structure you see here. Uh, it's about a three or maybe a four feet drop. And there's a pond up here. There's a private pond uh, above here, and uh, so this thing obviously is an issue for fish passage. Certainly, I know I know Atlantic salmon, uh, adult Atlantic salmon, are able to get up, but that's about it. Uh, the brook trout, uh, rainbow smelt, and gaspero uh, are often seen in the in the pool below here. This is only about a half a kilometer from salt water, 
So, and this this has been in place for uh, you know 60 or 70 years. So this has been a fish passage problem for many years. Now we could take it out, and we and we did take it out, but the landowner wanted to uh, wanted to retain uh, the pond uh, that was on his property. So we the compromise was we would take the uh, the dam out, and we would build a series of ripples, like I talked about earlier. There are actually four ripples in place here. Uh, that actually, that in step for, step fashion, allow the fish to get up into the pond. The pond is up here; you can't see it, uh, but the pond it remains in place. And instead of one big drop, we have uh, four or five drops. And this is what it looks like looking downstream, and they're just basically a series series of ripples that allow uh, fish to get up uh, in, in into the pond. And at the very top, this is this is the pond we talked about here. We want to retain, and at the very top, this is the last ripple you see here, and there's a, a net full of um, of rainbow smelt. So for the first time in 60 or 70 years, rainbow smelt are able to actually negotiate uh, getting up into the pond and up into the spawning ground. So if they pass rainbow smelt, it'll pass anything. They're 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 about the weakest of the weak when it comes to fish passage. They're not very strong when it comes to swimming. And uh, often, if, if we have a fish passage problem close to salt water, we try to we try to design the structure to allow these uh, rainbow smelt uh, to get up. Because we know if rainbow smelt can get up, then the uh, the other species uh, that we're worried about, whether they're you know trout or gaspro, can uh, can negotiate. It's one thing to get um, fish up to the mouth of a culvert. It's another thing to get them through the culvert. And uh, often, if there's no breaks in the current within the culvert, then that will be a blockage in itself by way of either, either the water's too shallow or, or the water's too fast. And so, uh, so the first order of business is getting to the getting getting into the mouth of the culvert. The, the next order of business is getting in through the culvert. And often, you'll see these today. These are these are baffled. Uh, culvert. So we've got a uh, in this particular case, it's a concrete structure with a with a wooden bottom, and they fasten these baffles. These are wooden baffles that are actually fastened to the floor of the culvert, and they they and they sort of act like stones uh, in that they break the current up and actually dam the water up. So uh, you know, have, as shallow water, the water's a little deeper, and uh, they have you know breaks in the current in, in behind these uh, in behind these uh, structures to allow the fish to get up through. And uh, over here, you'll see. I haven't done this, by the way, but this is something I sort of stole off the net. But in some cases, people have actually added stones uh, to uh, to these culverts to break the current to allow uh, these fish to get up through. Now, I haven't done this uh, on PEI, but in other areas, it is tried. Um, but uh, have it have it known that uh, when you add anything to a culvert, whether it's stone or whether it's uh, whether it's logs, you are actually reducing the capacity of that culvert to carry water. These things are usually uh, designed uh, you know, to carry a certain amount of water, usually a one in 50 year rain event. Uh, if, it was, if it was installed um, you know, two or three decades ago, they were usually designed to, to manage a one in 50 year rain event. And, but if you add, uh, add stones or, or, or logs, uh, you may only be reducing the the uh, the profile of the culvert by maybe you know five percent, but you may be reducing the capacity of the culvert to uh, carry water by much higher, maybe twenty percent. As soon as you rough up the floor, it actually really reduces the the culvert's capacity uh, to carry water. So keep that in mind if you're going to rough up the surface by putting stone in place or uh, or uh, baffles in place that you are in fact reducing the uh, culvert's capacity to uh, to carry water and if it's already undersized it's uh, and today a one in 50 a year rain event is not uncommon if it's already undersized you may want to talk to an engineer before you uh, before you do that another shot of baffles this is uh, this is the one uh, the design that's more common in PEI with the uh, with a straight uh, structure on one side and, a, and, a, and a, an angled structure on the other side to uh, to do do things in the water and uh, to break the current. So this is the one we, we see most common in PEI. Here's one again that I haven't tried. Uh, this is a uh, you know a round concrete uh, culvert, and uh, they've actually embedded uh, these uh, these blocks in here. Um, um, I don't see why it wouldn't work. I haven't tried it. I will be trying it this summer in PEI. We're going to be putting uh, the wooden blocks on a wooden wooden bottom culvert here on PEI to try this out, but. Uh, just to give you an idea of some of the other techniques that may be, uh, may be applied uh, other than just adding stone or adding, uh, adding baffles. 
And of course, the solution for uh, for rotted floors is to replace the floors. And um, and uh, there's a number of uh, every year at PEI they they do you know five or ten of these. You actually go and put new new spruce floors. And this is not perhaps the greatest example because uh, the water is uh, is very very shallow. But uh, in this particular case, this this floor was uh, was recently replaced. But as you can see, we've got other issues that those be in uh, water velocity and water depth issues. So you have to you have to think about resolving those. When it comes to uh, replacing culverts, uh, bridges are, are definitely the best. Uh, here, here's a, this is before and after. There's, there's, a, uh, there's an old culvert here. This is a private uh, road crossing. And this gentleman has a culvert, and he's put everything in the world in here. There's a dryer vent. Uh, there's a, some sort of metal pipe, another pipe here. He's trying to increase the capacity of, uh, of this culvert because, because the road continues to wash out. Uh, so we went in this year with the watershed group um, on the watershed that I live on, and actually took this structure out and put uh, and put a actually a bridge in. Uh, so these these things are the best. Um, these if they're designed and, and sized properly, they they rarely cause any issues with uh, with fish passes. Be aware, be aware that you want to make sure that if you're building the bridge, you want to you want to usually put the bridge abutments uh, uh, roughly about bank full. So uh, make sure the bridge is very wide, um, you know, a lot wider than summer flow. In this particular case, it's almost at bank flow here. So make them wide. Uh, so spring, uh, you, sh you should know what your bank flow, bank flow width, it, width is, which is your spring flow width, and try to get your bridge abutments out in, into bank flow, and that, and that will not cause any erosion problems or fish passage problems. Another one here, this is, of course, our furry friends, uh, 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 beavers, uh, they, they love culverts because they're easy to block. And this is another one on the water that I live on. And uh, of course, when they when they block the culverts, you get you get uh, you know, uh, water going over top of the uh, top of the road, and has the potential to wash the road out. And obviously, there's some fish passage problems with uh, when you have a culvert that, that that looks like this. And the solution, of course, is another bridge. And this is another bridge. Uh, the design, like the one I showed you previously, and it was we just remove the culvert and. and Put, a, put the bridge abutments in place, and uh, we suspect we won't have any problems in the future with fish passage, and hopefully uh, with, uh, with our furry friends. And of course, you have to know when to throw in the towel. When you look at uh, you know culverts of, uh, of this you know, issues of this magnitude, I mean, there's no way you're going to uh, you're going to get fish up through here. So this this particular culvert should be put on the uh, on the list to to be replaced. Uh, in this particular case is a, uh, a private crossing, and they've got uh, three culverts here and there. They're definitely undersized. You can see the, the roads actually eroding out, which means the water is obviously in, on high flow, and spring flow is going over top of the road. So this is a lost cause. Uh, so you know you should be looking at a bridge or at least culverts that are, you know, culvert capacity, was, which is uh, quite a bit uh, bigger than this here. So uh, no one to throw in the towel. These things are not worth uh, working on. Uh, the, the ideal solution would be either a replacement or, or with, a, with a bigger culvert or, or a bridge. Culvert designs, the best ones are, are the, uh, the natural bottom ones you see here. So basically you've got uh, concrete uh, structures that uh, either a, an arch made of metal or concrete sits on. You have a natural bottom uh, substrate. Fish are designed you know, to, uh, to negotiate these the best. So these are the best. These are the uh, this one particular ones here often have a flat bottom, but it may not be a, it may not be a natural bottom. It may be a metal bottom or a concrete bottom or a wooden bottom. But at least you have the option to uh, to baffle the structure or put stones in place because because it's a flat surface. These are uh, the worst. So these are these are the cheapest to install, and these are usually the corrugated um, uh, metal ones. Um, cheap to build, cheap to uh, put in place. When it comes to fish passage, uh, these are certainly the worst. They, they tend to focus the water, and they give you little options uh, to get uh, to break the current uh, in, in the culvert. And uh, uh, I dread when I see these uh, these these ones putting in. Uh, just when you thought things were uh, were bad, they're now using these new culverts, which are some sort of plastic composite, and they're very smooth. And often you'll see a culvert that's uh, that's failing. They'll actually use these as inserts. They'll so slide this right in inside a uh, Corrugated uh, metal culvert, or use them as a new culvert, and they're and they're very they're they're very smooth compared to even the uh, the metal uh, corrugated uh, culverts. And 
as a as a fact as a result there there's no absolutely no breaks in the current so um, the, the smoother the air the, the worse the air for fish passage and even though they're a new design they're actually worse than even the, the metal core gate ones these are the best and if you're going to put a culvert in place make sure it's a natural bottom this is one here in brood now pei and uh, basically what you're doing is you make sure that the culvert is big enough that it's at bank flow uh, a bank full on either side of the, of the brook, and you just leave the uh, the river in a na in a natural state, and uh, you can be assured that, uh, that you're going to have fish passage in this particular situation. Some of these culverts uh, do have uh, you know prefab inserts in them. Uh, they're basically fish ladders that are laid flat, and uh, you know sometimes they're effective, uh, and you know they're not as good at, at I wouldn't say they'd be as good as these, but at least uh, there's some thought given to fish passage, and I've seen those used in New Brunswick, and, and this is actually on the PPI. But uh, if you had a choice, uh, that would be my choice. Now, when it comes to fish passage, you have to be strategic here. When you look at a particular watershed, uh, you, know, you, you should uh, you should do a survey of the water of the watershed culverts and determine which ones that are problematic, and map them out, and look at your budget. And uh, then, then go back and determine which ones are, are going to be going to, uh, going to, that are going to be priority. And the things you have to be aware of is that you have to have to be aware of two things: is that you have to know what fish you have in your in your watershed. So some of these fish don't actually migrate very far up and in, up into the watershed. In this particular case, this is, this is just a mock-up watershed that I put together here. Uh, salt water down here, so you're fairly close to salt water. And if you're dealing with rainbow smelt here, which is a fish, of course, that comes in from salt water and it needs fresh water to spawn. These particular fish don't actually migrate too far up into the watershed. The PEI, I've, I've not seen them any, any more than 10 kilometers of above head of tide. So if you're looking at a culvert way up on top of the watershed, it may be 20 to 30 or 40 kilometers upstream. Uh, you know, don't be worried about these fish. Even though these are the weak, weakest swimmers, uh, don't over-engineer your, uh, your fish passage uh, project here uh, so these fish can can get up because they're not going to get there anyway. So know how far, know what fish you have in your watershed, know how far they migrate up, and then design your fish passage project around that. Now, looking at this particular watershed, if you look down here, the, the red stars are the ones uh, that show are, are poor passage. The green one, green ones are good passage, and, and the yellow ones would be uh, selective passage. Usually, uh, usually these ones uh, are, uh, you know, the selective passage means uh, the salmonids. So they, the brook trout or Atlantic salmon are, are able to negotiate, but the non salmonids the, the weaker, the weaker swimmers are, aren't able to negotiate. But if you don't have these non salmonids getting up uh, this high in the watershed, then you would just design uh, these uh, fish passage around around your salmonids. Uh, down here, you look down here. The, the obvious problem here would be this particular uh, tributary here, which is uh, close to the head of tide and it has a blockage here uh, for fish passage. So. If I were to pick one in this watershed, I would pick this particular one first because it's so close to the head of tide, and it's actually blocking fish passage for a whole tributary, and I would focus my energies there. Some issues here, of course, with fish passage, but these are very high in the in these sub watersheds. So uh, you know, I would uh, even though there are issues with fish passage, what do you gain? You gain a little bit of uh, a little bit of headwater here, but it's not a big deal. So in my mind, uh, my energy would would be uh, would be uh, expended on, on this particular fish passage project. So know your fish, know how far they migrate up into the system, and do your uh, culvert inventory and then prioritize those and uh, work on them, on the ones that are most problematic first. So just to, uh, to summarize, uh, when it comes to uh, road crossings, what makes for a, uh, for a good road crossing? Well, the natural substrate. This, these are two examples. There's a culvert and, and a bridge, and they both have uh, they both have natural stone in there, and that provides those breaks in the current that allows for better fish passage. Um, try to match the natural depth and velocity. So go upstream and go downstream, and do your measurements and make sure that the uh, the, the opening is as wide as the river itself, uh, and that it's not too steep compared to what you would find upstream and downstream. And the velocities are the same. And of course, that uh, uh, that bank full uh, 1.2 times the natural bank width, which is bank full, that's important. So your 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 abutments should be outside, or at least at the 1.2 times natural bank width that will 
for bank flow. And that, and that means in the, in the springtime that the water is able to get down through there without uh, uh, causing too much erosion or, or issues with fish passage. And of course, these open bottom ones, whether it's a bridge or uh, open bottom cul culverts are, are preferred as they allow for natural bottoms and for, for, for more of a natural passage. Okay, I'm going to switch gears here. I'm going to talk about uh, sediment trapping. And PEI, PEI has, has uh, if you don't know, has a real issue with with sedimentation. We live in a province with uh, where about one acre in five is in is in production, in, in agricultural production. Much of that production is in potato production, and as a result, uh, we've got you know extremely high erosion rates. Uh, on PEI, and, and it's not uncommon to get millions of tons of topsoil that wash off our fields and eventually, you know, find their way into our streams and rivers here in PEI. So this is a shot of a, of a potato field in the springtime of erosion coming off the field, of course, and it gets into a ditch, and that ditch shrinks into a brook, and eventually it finds its way into, into, into a river. This is not uncommon. This is a shot of PEI after a rainfall, and a lot of our rivers actually turn this color after heavy rainfall. The color of chocolate milk. It's been happening uh, for, for for many decades, and as a result, we've got a you know, real major uh, load, bed load of uh, of sediment. You can see here what I mean. This is uh, looking down at the bottom of the stream. You can see, you can see actually see the uh, it looks like a beach. Actually, there's so much sediment down here that uh, it looks like Cabernet's beach. And uh, so the issue is we've got decades and decades of uh, sediment that has has dumped into the stream. So what a lot of the restoration crews, uh, the community groups that are charged with uh, restoring their the rivers and watersheds, they're doing is they're getting in there and they're actually they're actually doing some stream clearing. So the idea is to take out a lot of the uh, the deadfalls, a lot of the uh, large organic debris to help speed up the water. Uh, unfortunately, the forest and the PEI can cut two or three times, and what uh, what's left over is not remnant of, of, of Acadian forest and often you get a lot of older growth, you get uh, you know vegetation that would not normally be there, you get a lot of uh, uh, organic debris like you see here that actually slows the water down and in fact it trapped, it's been trapping all the sediment that's been washing into our streams uh, uh, over the decades. Now the issue is of course once you remove this uh, lower, large organic debris this stuff becomes mobile. The stuff that's been trapped there for uh, for decades now starts to move downstream. If you're doing restoration work downstream, you certainly don't want uh, these uh, you know tons and tons of material to wash that wash downstream and fill in your pools or to fill in your estuary. So we looked at a couple of techniques uh, to actually trap that material, to intercept that material before it in fact gets downstream and ruin any, any techniques or um, any efforts if you uh, you've done downstream. So this is a uh, this is what we call a bypass sediment basin, and this, some people think we're kind of crazy when we uh, when we pitch this one. And often, it's not easy uh, to convince uh, you know, the regulators, whether it's uh, fishers and oceans or or the provincial uh, uh, the province, uh, to to get a permit to do this. But we we've been successful in the past in, in in building these things. And basically, what you're doing is you are building a large sediment basin that is beside the natural stream. So we have a natural stream here uh, with the water moving in this direction. And uh, so uh, before we go in and do our brush clearing uh, upstream, which as we know will mobilize uh, all that sediment and, and cause that sediment to wash, wash downstream, we build these what we call bypass sediment, sediment ponds. And so we dig them out. And the stream uh, here is actually running down into on the on the uh, on the tree line. You can't see, but it's trust me, it's it's down through here. So you dig the sediment basin out, and you put a diversion dam in place. The dam I'll show you is that is up here, and you divert the water into the sediment basin, and then eventually back into the uh, back into the original stream bed. So this this stream uh, bed goes dry because you divert the water in, and as the water uh, comes into the sediment basin. The sediment basin is so big that, the, the, of course, the water slows down. When the water slows down, it tends to drop its bed load, and it actually traps the sediment that's moving downstream into this into this big sediment basin. And what you do, uh, of course, is that when it fills up uh, with sediment, you have two options. You can just uh, open up 
the diversion dam, let the water go through, and you just leave it be. It will eventually just grow over. It will dewater because the water is now being diverted down through the original uh, channel. Uh, and it will dewater. It will just grass over or uh, you can plant it. Or you can actually dig it out. Do you find that there's still more sediment coming downstream? And sometimes it takes two or three years for that sediment to move downstream. You can actually open up the open up the dam, let the water go through, and then use heavy machinery and dig out this uh, this material and truck it away or, or cast it aside. And when it's empty, you can uh, again re-divert the water through and, and to trap that sediment, so it doesn't get down into uh, into the lower reaches of the watershed. So this is. Uh, this is actually the same sediment basin. So we're looking at uh, down here as it's coming back into the into the uh, into the stream. We, we make sure it's well rocked and has enough uh, uh, rocks in place so it doesn't wash out. And the upper reaches, uh, the diversion uh, dam you see here, it's actually made of, uh, of uh, sandbags that are interlaced, and we actually covered them up with a filter fabric and put stone on it. And so the water is coming down from the river, and instead of going this way, uh, it's actually being diverted into the sediment basin. And so all that bed load gets uh, gets diverted into the sediment basin. There is a bit of a dip here. You'll see here in the in the dam structure, and if you get a crazy high event, maybe a 100-year storm, that it actually allows the water to go up and over and take some of the pressure off the uh, off the sediment basin. Another shot of one here. This is a different basin. This is the uh, unfinished uh, diversion dam here. The natural river is actually running down here. You can see it's not very big. I think it's only four meters wide. And this is a, this is a, this is the same sediment basin here. After one year, you can see the low, the bed low that's actually coming into the uh, into the sediment basin from from the uh, from the watershed above. They've actually, uh, I think, in this particular case, they cleared. Uh, four kilometers of stream uh, upstream here, and this is this bed load uh, has you know uh, has been in place for probably 50 years, and so the, the stream is very narrow for for uh, for uh, four meters wide and four kilometers, so not a, not a big area, but this particular sediment basin has already uh, captured about 174 dump load uh, dump truck loads over three years. So this is a you know, and again, it's fill, uh, as I checked this year, it's actually filled again. So we're looking at a you know, probably 225 truckloads, tandem truckloads of material that was intercepted uh, by the sediment basin that would otherwise have been washed down in the, into the lower reaches of the watershed, uh, and perhaps even into the estuary and filling the estuary. So that gives you a sense of how big the sediment issue is is on PEI. And uh, how effective these uh, these structures can be. Okay, so that's one particular uh, method for trapping uh, sediment. Here's another one that uh, that's I would uh, I would say it's almost unique to PEI. I have seen it used in other regions, but not, not that often. And this is uh, what we call brush matting. And this is the brush mat you see here. This is uh, you know this is a bunch of all basically what it is organic material that's laid down on the uh, on the inside of a uh, of a corner of a, of a stream. And it's really designed uh, to capture uh, sediment uh, during high flow, usually in spring flow, um, uh, as because that's what usually when the when the sediment is, is is moving. And the idea is here is that if you look at uh, the way water moves in the particular in any stream, the water on the outside of the bend moves faster versus the water on the inside of the bend. And as a result, the slower water on the inside tends to uh, deposit uh, deposit sediment. This is a, a deposition area. This is an erosion area. And what happens often, even, in, even on a healthy stream, uh, the water is moving so fast on the outside bend, it tends to erode that outside bank. And the material that's eroded on the outside bank is often deposited on the opposite side, which is the slow side. It's called a point fire. And uh, you, you look at any river from, uh, you know, from space or from an aerial photo photograph, you'll see the these point fires everywhere. So these rivers are constantly moving by eroding the outside of the bend and depositing that material on the inside. Uh, so the river isn't getting wider uh, because what's uh, what's eroded is deposited on the, on the inside. So that is the natural area of deposition, uh, and this, these are the areas where we actually uh, want to put these uh, put these brush mats. This is an aerial shot here, so you can see um, these erases here. The point bars, 
this is obviously not PEI, but uh, these are all the point bars I talked about on the inside of the corner, and this material is, uh, is uh, often material that's been eroded from the opposite side of the bank, or in PEI, it could be material being washed downstream. So those are the areas you want to put these, uh, these brush mats in. So you you uh, you basically what you do is uh, you uh, you have usually it's usually a sandy bank here and you, what you do is you just put uh, stakes in the ground like you see here and you just infill these uh, this area with uh, with either uh, you know, conifer trees or, or brush uh, and that actually slows down the water and actually traps uh, traps the uh, the sediment. Now a lot of people are concerned and say, well, are, you know, what, what are the, what, is there an issue with uh, with putting those in place? Because you actually may actually narrow the stream, causing some pressure on the opposite bank. Well, if, if it's uh, if you have a, an erosion problem like you have in PEI, often uh, what happens is the river actually is already wider. Uh, when you dump uh, tons of sediment in, in a particular river system, often what happens is you know, the streams actually a grade, meaning they get wider and, and shallower. So basically, when you're putting these stuff, uh, these uh, brush mats in place, you're actually not really narrowing the stream. Uh, you're actually narrowing the stream back to its original original width. So the gauge here, this is actually a um, a picture of uh, of, uh, of uh, the start of the uh, of a brush mat. This is the uh, this is the inside corner. This is the uh, the point bar we talked about. So the water is coming downstream in this direction here faster on the outside, slower on the inside. There, that's why that's why it's depositing this material. You see the stakes in the ground, uh, so they're staking out these one a little bit further out uh, beyond the uh, perimeter of the of the uh, of the point fire, and then they go in and they, they just drop in um, uh, brush, sometimes Christmas trees or, or conifers mostly. And then and they and they tie twine. You see, there's twine uh, that are that are a matrix of twine that holds this, uh, this material in place. Usually, it's layered or two or three layers in place. And then this is another one here. So there's your point bar. There's the finished product. This is the same stream, uh, 2007. And there's a before and after shot here. So you can see these things completely disappear. They just get uh, inundated with silt, and then and they grow grass. And uh, so you don't see them, and of course you see the difference in uh, in the substrate here. We got a very muddy stream on this side here, lots of sedimentation, and uh, a lot of the material you see has been trapped in in here and gone back to what what we consider to be a rocky or ripply stru uh, uh, structure. Uh, another one here, before and after. Um, again, uh, on the inside corner, there's your brush mat uh, before. And I'm not sure how long after it looks like. Got to be two or three years after uh, after its construction. Again, you don't see it, and note note the difference in in the substrate here. We got uh, one that's 100% silted to sand it to one that's uh, very very rocky. So these things are are quite effective uh, in in trapping silt. Uh, the thing is, you have to be aware that you don't want to build them too far out into the stream because uh, sometimes they, if you, if you do build them too far out of the stream, they can actually cause some erosion on the opposite bank. Uh, but certainly a technique that's uh, that's being used to great effect here on PEI, and that of course traps a lot of material. It does two things: it actually perhaps brings the river back into a, a natural width, and it traps a lot of material uh, before it actually uh, migrates down into uh, the lower portions of the watershed, into perhaps areas that you've restored already, or into the estuary, uh, and, and uh, causes some problems with uh, with shellfish and, and other critters that live, uh, live down there. So that's it uh, for uh, for my talk, and now we'll open the floor to, uh, to questions. Thank you, Todd. That was absolutely excellent. So much good information in that presentation. That was terrific. So um, I think we Thank you. I think we've I've seen one question here that's already come in. So a question from Peter Salonius. He's he's saying the PEI arched culverts you showed with wood floors looked as if they could be fixed by totally removing the wood floor and letting stream sediment wash in to form a new natural floor. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, Peter. Uh, the only problem is is that the the arch culverts with the wooden floor are often undersized. Uh, if 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 the if the culverts were designed for a one in hundred year event, uh, 
meaning they'd be wide enough, then that would be a, wouldn't be a problem. The reason they put the uh, wooden floors in it, it sort of confines the water to the culvert itself, so during high flow it doesn't undermine the uh, the ends of the culverts and uh, and cause the whole culvert to, to undermine and collapse. So if if the culvert was uh, you know just any, you know, designed for a one in a hundred year flow, you could do that. But these things are usually designed for one in fifty, and as a result, they're really in today's world where a one in fifty year event is now really one in five. Uh, that uh, they wouldn't take the high flow because it would tend to undermine the culvert itself uh, and, uh, and cause them to collapse in no time. Okay, the next question comes from Nathan Wilbur. He's asking, do you find there are sediment deprivation problems downstream of sediment traps, causing erosion and other problems? Uh, no, I mean, you know, these these sediment traps, the bypass sediment traps, don't capture everything. Um, um, you know, they capture some of the heavy material, sand and 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 silt. Uh, they don't they don't capture clay material. But uh, what we see is that uh, you know some of it gets through. Uh, but certainly, it's uh, you know it's a much better situation with with these sediment traps versus not having them. Like I said, in that particular sediment trap, we captured 150 or uh, roughly 150 truckloads of material, which would otherwise, uh, you know, uh, um, migrate down uh, into uh, into the lower reaches of the watershed, which really caused problems. So they don't they don't capture everything, uh, but they I would I would estimate they remove probably 95 percent of the of the bed load before the uh, before it gets down, you know, uh, below the uh, below the sediment basin. Okay, next question comes from Jeff Surtees. Todd, what was the rough cost of the sediment trap project? Hi, Jeff. Uh, well, it depends. It depends on the size of the sediment basin. Um, they, the ones I showed you, they're not that big. You guys, not a, you know, not a big area, but they were costing about fifteen, twenty thousand dollars to dig them out uh, initially, and then of course you got to go in and dig them out again. Uh, you know, if, if you want the uh, structure to function for two or three years and the infilling, then there's, you have to you know, work in the cost of uh, a future uh, excavation. So, you know, it could be 15, 20 grand to, uh, to build it initially and then maybe seven to 10,000 to clean them out uh, every time you want to clean them out. Okay, next question is from Joshua Roy. Have you undertaken a systematic inventory of road crossings and subsequent prioritization of habitat and feasibility for restoration? I have done it in some, some watersheds. I mean, uh, the, and that's an important question because, you know, I, the, the watershed that I live on, uh, the West River on, on PEI, I, I've done an inventory of all the, all the, all the culverts and, and assessed whether they're pro problematic uh, based on the fish that would normally migrate there. And then we, uh, then we look at that and we put together uh, you know our priority list with respect to which ones have to be fixed first. Uh, in my estimation and and estimations of colleagues in other areas who have done the same and and watersheds in New Brunswick and in Nova Scotia, somewhere between sixty and seventy percent of culverts that are in place today, certainly on this coast and these coasts, are problematic for fish passage. These things were installed, you know, for most of them. 30, 40, 50 years ago with little consideration given to the fish passage. They're basically just designed to allow water uh, to come through under the under the road without washing the road out and there was very little consideration given to fish. So a vast, you know, um, certainly a majority of them are causing problems for fish passage, whether they're hung or whether there's a velocity barrier or uh, what have you. But it's important to do, uh, certainly. I mentioned before, make sure you, you know, because you're not going to be able to replace all of them in, in, in a given year, make sure you, uh, you prioritize, prioritize them first. And, and my, my advice is to, is to pick the ones that are lowest in the system first. Okay, next one is a comment from Rick Simpson. He says, great stuff. Here in the Pacific Northwest, anadromous rainbow trout equals steelhead, highly prized by sport fishers. Yes, yeah, we have actually uh, a coincidence. We have rainbow trout here too. They were stocked uh, back in the 20s, uh, 1920s, and then we have done. We have 20 rivers in PEI, 22 rivers in PEI with self-sustaining rainbow trout stocks, and many of them uh, are actually sea run, they're actually steelhead too. So for some particular reason, uh, rainbow trout have really um, uh, taken to PEI like they have have nowhere else in, in eastern Canada, and uh, so we certainly see a lot of steelhead. Uh, they wouldn't be as big as 
you know, as, as a DC fish, but I've seen them 10 or 12 pounds here in PEI, the or rivers. The next question comes from Anita Doucette. She asks, do you have a set protocol for evaluating or grading the severity of suspended culverts? And did you ever have to install fish ladders? Uh, the first answer to the first question, no. I, I, I just, I, I, I have, you know, 25 years experience doing this, so I often can go out at a glance and say, this is, you know, this is too much for, uh, for this particular species uh, or that particular species. Uh, uh, sometimes I do do uh, some vo water velocity uh, testing uh, with, a, with a velocity meter. Often I'll measure the length of the culvert uh, and, uh, and actually how high the culvert is perched uh, will dictate whether you can actually uh, remediate that. So the riffle building uh, stuff that I've been involved in, where you build those uh, series of small little dams below there, whether that's feasible or not is really dictated on how high the culvert is perched uh, and uh, what have you. So I don't have any set protocols, although there are apparently protocols in place. I, I just go basically uh, how I feel, how it looks with uh, some rudimentary, uh, rudimentary measurements. And what was the second part of that question? Um, and did you ever have to install fish ladders? Uh, I haven't. Uh, we have we have fish ladders here on PEI, uh, certainly. And, and I didn't get into that particular uh, uh, part of the talk because uh, uh, I didn't have time. But fish ladders are problematic too. Don't think uh, don't think fish ladders are going to be the answer to to your problem for fish passages. Often, often these fish ladders are are, uh, are very selective. On, on what fish are, are, are they're, they're able to pass, and um, I know that we probably have 100 fish ladders in the PEI, and not one of them, not one of them will pass uh, rainbow smelt. Some of them will pass some Gasparo species uh, for not too long, but these things are basically designed to pass salmonids, so big trout and uh, and and, uh, and Atlantic salmon. Uh, the fish ladders on this coast are basically the basically designed on the fish ladders in DC, where they have all kinds of you know five or six different species of, uh, of, uh, of salmon, and they're really designed to pass the, uh, the big and the strong fish. So there are certainly problems with, with fish ladders. I know uh, in Nova Scotia, some of these perched culverts, uh, they're, they're, they're actually going to be installing very small fish ladders. Uh, instead, of, instead of the riffle building uh, stuff that I'm doing, they're going to try to experiment with putting uh, uh, you know, small little wooden fish ladders at the outlet, near the outlet, one side of the outlet of these culverts to try to get the fish up to the uh, to the mouth of these perch culverts. So that, the, the jury is still out on whether uh, whether that will work or not, uh, but we'll, we'll have to stay tuned on that one. Um, and maybe I'll just add to the first part of the question. Um, I know CARP in Nova Scotia has a really well-developed protocol for assessing culverts. Uh, that's for use for watershed groups. So, Anita, after the call, I can uh, I can forward that on to you if you like. So the next question comes from Carolee McCaskill. Uh, the question is, doesn't a bypass sediment basin affect the habitat downstream for fish, slowing the flow? Who do watershed groups consult before building these basins? Well, it, the, uh, the basin itself, uh, so what happens is the, uh, maybe I can go back here. Can, can people still see my screen? They should be able to, yep. Okay, let's go back and have a look here. Where am I here? So basically, the uh, you know you're you're actually bypassing the uh, the stream. So the, there's a, there's a portion of the stream that actually goes uh, that goes dry. There's no doubt about that. So that that area is going to be affected, like you see here, because that thing goes dry. But once the water comes back into the main system, it's the same amount of water that would be coming in through here. So it doesn't really affect uh, the stream per se down in it, you know below the below the uh, sediment basin itself. It does water in, water out. Yeah, we're talking about 100, maybe 100 meters or 200 meters of, uh, of uh, dry stream bed, so there certainly would be an impact there. But uh, it's not reducing the water volume in any, in any measure by, by, by diverting it through the, uh, the bypass pond. So once it gets back into the main, the main channel, uh, it's really, uh, you're, you're, not, you're not really affecting the, uh, the water volume or flow. Okay, next question comes from Andrew Daggett. Have you been able to use native material to build the riffles, or did you have to truck in the material? The material is trucked in, and you have to be careful. You have to size these things uh, correctly. Um, I tend to oversize them. There, there, there's hydraulic formulas uh, that you can use to actually to size, uh, size these things and make sure they don't wash out. And the idea is 
that anchor stone you see here has got to be able to uh, survive a one in a hundred year flow. And, and there and there is some hydraulic formulas that uh, that you can use actually to size those, so you know that in a hundred one in a hundred flow this thing won't move. So this stuff, they're you know, pretty heavy, heavy stuff. So it's trucked in, and sometimes it's actually uh, in this particular case, what you're seeing here, this this stuff was trucked in, dumped along the side, and it was hand placed, although you know rolled into the water and rolled in place by by people. The, uh, the this one here, uh, if I can go back here, this one here was actually uh, constructed with heavy machinery. Uh, the, the anchor stone was such that it was uh, it was really too big to handle, so it was trucked in, and uh, and you had a, a high mac or uh, another piece of heavy machinery in place that would that would actually place that stuff in place because it was so big. Okay, next question is from David Cody. He asks, "Do you prefer bypass traps to in-stream traps?" I do. Uh, the bypass thing is. It's somewhat new here. Uh, you know, back 20 years ago, we would put the in-stream ones in, but the in-stream ones, uh, you know, they do work, uh, but you're really impacting the habitat. So, it, um, you know, at least with the bypass ones, when, once you uh, take this, take the uh, the dam out, it goes back to its original uh, stream bed, and you really have an impact at the uh, the stream uh, in, in, in any big way. Um, versus the one that are in stream. The in stream ones work, we've used them in the past, uh, you, and what he means is that you, you instead of having a bypass, you actually dig it right in the uh, center of the channel, and so we basically what you're doing is, uh, is creating a, a basin uh, right in that channel itself, but boy, you're really impacting the, uh, the natural environment in, in that way, and uh, at least with the, uh, and then of course you've got to get in there and dig it out every time. So uh, you're always mucking around with the, with the stream. So when it, if they fill in, you have to get in there and, and dig it out so you're causing sedimentation downstream. At least with the bypass pond, you can actually, when it comes time to dig this sediment bypass pond out, you re-divert the water down through the original stream bed. And then once you're mucking around in the bypass, uh, that material is not actually migrating down into the stream. So for two reasons, for those two reasons, uh, I, I really prefer the bypass pond over the in-stream one. And of course, when you're done with it, you just walk away. You just open up the uh, open up the diversion dam, uh, let the water run through, and you can leave all that sediment in place, and it'll grass over. So, so uh, I really prefer the bypass ones if you can do it. I mean, you have to have, you, know, you have to have the land in the area to do it, but uh, I prefer them certainly over the in-stream ones. Carolee McCaskill asks, "Can you truck the sediment away and or leave them to dry dry out after rejoining the stream to its original path?" Yeah, uh, the if you look at my screen here, my cursor is all that material you'll see, you'll see up in the bank is actually the material that was actually excavated out of the sediment basin initially, and uh, you can often you can cast it up and behind and uh, and put materials in place so it doesn't wash back in, or you can truck it away, uh, but uh, usually we usually we usually uh, leave it on site. And uh, like you see up here, and we actually put, uh, you know, we, we try to seed it out so that there's grass grow on it in, in short order so it doesn't actually migrate back into the stream. So rarely do we truck it away. More often, we have, if we have the area, we actually put it on site, flatten it out, and, and try to get some vegetation on it as soon as possible so that it uh, is not mobile. Hey, next question is from Ben Whalen. He says, hello, Todd. Thanks for the great talk. I was wondering what kind of contribution or support your watershed group is getting from the Department of Transportation. It's getting great support, actually, um, from transportation. Uh, we have a good rapport uh, with transportation. We've done, you know, we've done a, um, a culvert inventory. Uh, they know all the problems, and we provided a report to transportation with pictures and and, and, and a map and GIS locations, saying that uh, you know these ones are the uh, these are the priority culverts, and uh, every year we uh, you know, we deal with one or two of these culverts. I mean, it, it's 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 going to be unrealistic uh, to uh, to fix all your culvert problems uh, in, in you know in one or two years. It may take decades, but uh, we have a good uh, a good relationship with with transportation. Often they've actually replaced culverts for us. And uh, often, when we build these ripple structures, they're actually, you know, they're actually purchasing and delivering these large stone for us, and perhaps even providing the heavy machinery to put that place that stuff in place. They know it's a lot cheaper 
to build a riffle structure than it is to replace a culvert. Some of these culverts could be even half a million dollars or a million dollars to replace, depending on how big they are. Whereas, you know, these riffle structures uh, that I showed you, you know, fifteen to twenty thousand uh, dollars to put put in place uh, to resolve a fish pass each problem. So it's a lot cheaper than to them in the long run. And it keeps that culvert in place at least until uh, you know until it's ready to be replaced because it's because it's failing. So a good report. Jackie Bourgeois asks, I was wondering where would be the best placement for a sediment trap? Near the head of the tide as opposed to further upstream? The best place, no, what you want to do is you want to intercept it before it gets uh, too far down into the watershed. So um, the issue is not necessarily just the estuary, but uh, you know all the freshwater portion of the watershed also. So I'll just crank this up here. So you've got, you've got salt water down here. And you're doing your stream clearing up here. So if you stream clear up here, this stuff is going to migrate all the way down through here and eventually into the estuary. But it's, it's going to be an issue with infilling the estuary, but it's also covering in, filling in pools all the way down through your freshwater portion of your watershed. So often we have a number of these. If we're going to be, if we're going to be doing some stream clearing, for instance, on this particular branch, we'll have a sediment basin here, another one here. We'll have a number of them all the way down through the system so that uh, all this material is captured here before it migrates downstream. So we'll have a series of, series of them in place uh, immediately below any any uh, any stream clearing, so we can uh, try to intercept that uh, stuff from migrating not just to the estuary and saltwater, but into the freshwater portion there too. Okay. The next question from Carolee McCaskill is: Is brush matting the in brush matting the point bar? How far from the edge of the point bar do you brush mat out? Average in meters. Well, it really depends on the uh, on the brush mat itself. You really shouldn't go beyond the confines of the of, of the of the point bar, and that's sort of the, the the rule of thumb. But I mean, there you can go in and do some fairly hefty hydraulic uh, calculating uh, to determine how wide the river should be at this particular point, based on the size of the watershed and based on you know there are formulas that will tell you that the river at this particular point should only be so many meters wide, and you can use that. But the, the easiest uh, way to do it, in my mind, is just to stay within the confines of the point bar. If you go too far beyond the confines of the part, point, point bar, it's, uh, then you, you, uh, you may run into some problems with respect to narrowing, narrowing the water uh, too much and then causing undue stress on the opposite side. So that's what we usually tell our folks is that, you know, because often they don't have the capacity, uh, you know, to work out these complicated hydraulic formulas, is to try to stay just within the confines of the uh, of the point bar. Now, in a lot of cases, you see there may maybe a little bit a little bit further, but it, the golden rule is that don't go any further than the point bar, and you shouldn't you shouldn't have any problems with respect to uh, you know pressure on the opposite bank. So I can't give you an actual meters or, or or width, but it really depends on how big the river is. If it's a big big river, then it could be you know your brush your brush mat may be 10 meters wide, whereas in a river like this here, it's only it's only two meters wide. It's just uh, just a reflection on on the on the size of uh, size of the brook itself, but stay try to stay within the confines of the, of the of the point bar, and you should be okay. John Gregory asks, "Don't the off-stream sediment traps themselves prevent fish migration?" No, they uh, they often they they they. they Often they fill right up with fish. Believe it or not, that we've seen them. Um, you know, we 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 check them every year and. Uh, and they often uh, they, they they create an unnatural deep pool, which and of course deep water is a form of cover itself, and so certainly the brook trout uh, really like these uh, like these deep areas, and they often will go in there and sit uh, sit low and sit fishing a great fishing area for for some people. So you really what what's happened? This is this is the outflow here of of the uh, of the bypass pond, and uh, so there's no issue with velocity. There's no issue with uh, with Fish passage, so the fish instead of going up through the original stream channel can easily, easily uh, swim up into into the bypass pond and 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 out into the up into the upper reaches. Also, there's no issue on either side for fish passage. Um, it's just whether or not they want to stay there or not. And often we do see um, uh, brookies, certainly brook trout, tend to really uh, like these areas because these things are you know, 10 or 15 feet deep. And that's a form of cover for brook trout. Brook trout like that deep, uh, deep, deep water, and uh, so uh, not a, not an issue certainly for fish passage. 
Rick Simpson makes the comment, interesting differences in geography here uh, in BC. Stream flows are highly variable here in the Okanagan, semi-arid desert, biogeoclimatic zone, 0 CFS to 3 CFS in August to uh, over a thousand CFS during freshet requires a lot of Newberry calculations to design in-stream restoration structures that survive. Yeah, yeah, certainly Newberry uh, would be the guy. He's, he's actually the guy that taught me to build some of these uh, these ripple structures uh, that I do in PEI. It is quite different in PEI. The uh, the uh, PEI rivers are uh, have a lot of um, a lot of uh, groundwater base flow. Base flow from groundwater is about 66 percent. So, in any given time of the year, 60, 66 percent of the water is actually ground is actually groundwater. So, we don't we don't get the uh, the major fluctuations in uh, in, in volume uh, like that you would experience in, in in BC. It's much more stable. Uh, rivers of uh, you know four or five meters wide don't do not dry up in PEI because there's so much uh, groundwater here in PEI and. Uh, we do, you know, we do see uh, the spring event, uh, the bank pool event. Uh, you'll get a 150, and sometimes we have actually experienced one 100-year uh, event last year. But uh, uh, compared to uh, BC, uh, our, you know, the water volumes are very stable here on PEI. I, I can't speak to the same for other regions in Atlantic Canada, but in PEI, we certainly have more stable flows. Monique Richard asks, do you have reports on the restoration work you've conducted available to share with NGOs as a learning tool? Uh, well, there, we have, we just, just published a uh, restoration manual for PEI uh, 2012, of which uh, three, four, three or four of us actually co-authored. Uh, and that, that manual actually out, outlines a lot of, a lot of these uh, restoration techniques, including these two, uh, the, the brush mat one and, and the in the uh, bypass sediment basins and a bunch of other restoration techniques. If you're interested in that, we can certainly send you uh, a, a PDF of that particular report. And yes, there are reports. Uh, a lot of the watershed groups do provide, because uh, because they're funded from various sources, they're required to provide uh, reports. Uh, and a lot of them do have reports on, on their work. And uh, if you want to shoot me a quick email, I can get those in your hands. Great. Inclu including the restoration manual that uh, there's a PDF link to it and uh, we'll show you some of these uh, some of these techniques that we use in PEI. That's terrific. And Todd, if you don't mind, I'll maybe post that link along with the recording of this presentation uh, yeah. on the website too, if that's okay with you. Yeah, that's fine, yes. Terrific. Um, next question is from Carolee McCaskill. Who pays for culverts, building bridges to replace broken culverts? How do you go about implementing your replacement if you're from a watershed group? It really depends on, you know, if it's a government culvert, uh, then the obvious uh, obvious choice is, is to go see government to get them fixed. And, and like I mentioned before, we have a pretty good rapport with uh, with government, and they've been uh, they've been good to us with respect to either replacing culverts or, or providing some sort of remediation uh, to get these fish up through uh, through these culverts, whether it's baffling or whether it's uh, riffle building, the technology, uh, you know, the, the, the design work is often provided by me, but they provide the uh, materials and heavy, heavy, heavy equipment, so there's a, there's a bit of a trade-off there. The, the issue is when you run into private crossings, uh, where the, and often the private crossings are worse, in my uh, estimation, with respect to, uh, you know, fish passage. And uh, so, you know, the government's not not going to step up, usually uh, going to step up and provide uh, funding for private crossings. Now the watershed that I live on, the West River here, has been successful, the watershed group, in getting funding here and there, trickling here and there. And those two bridges that I showed you earlier, they were both on private crossings. And we were able to get funding through non uh, other sources uh, to, uh, to, uh, to remove the culvert. And uh, and to put those uh, those bridges in place, and also we did, I think, if I remember correctly, had a little bit of support from Transportation and Public Works uh, Department of Transportation, you know, for heavy machinery or something like that. So it was a sort of a tri-party thing. So it really depends on what uh, who owns the culvert. If it's government, it's a no-brainer. If it's private, then you you certainly got to do a little more digging, a little more scratching to to dig up the resources uh, to get those uh, to get those things repaired. 
Okay, next is a comment from Nathan Wilbur. He says, uh, to address an earlier question about culvert inventories, he makes the remark that the Oromocto Watershed Association and the Hammond River Angling Association have both undertaken culvert inventories in their watersheds uh, to map and prioritize problem crossings. The next is a question from Rick Simpson. He asks, do you have the same trouble we have here getting post-stream rehabilitation funding for monitoring follow-up to determine fish productivity improvements actually occurred? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. I mean, um, anytime you're doing any sort of research, it's tough to find uh, money to do that. It seems to be easier to do the... Uh, the stuff that is more visible, right, the, the culvert replacement or the things that you can point to and say, look, uh, this is what we, we've done. But the follow-up stuff uh, is a little more problematic. And often we try to lean on the uh, post-secondary uh, institutions, whether Holland College or UPEI, that have, you know, grad students that have uh, perhaps uh, some time and money uh, to, to do some follow-up. Uh, that, that's been successful some of the time. But boy, let me tell you that the, you know to find resources to do that hardcore uh, research to determine uh, you know how you've impacted the productivity or the fish passage. That's I find that's hard to come by. Next question is from Carolee McCaskill. How much riffle structure length is appropriate when building rock pools, aka dams, to fix hung culverts? At what length of the riffle gradient would you build a second dam, and how many centimeters of water does smelt need to negotiate a culvert or riffle? A couple of questions right. there. Yeah, okay, let's go back here, and uh, where is the big one here, we'll look at this one here, I think. That's a good question, and uh, it, it really depends, it depends somewhat on on what you have to work with, how much area you have below the structure, uh, it, it depends somewhat on the slope of the river. Remember that as you move downstream below the culvert, you're losing elevation. Maybe you have a fairly steep river, you know, something that's running five or six degrees, and that as you move downstream, you're using elevation, so you're, uh, you have to compensate for that. So we try to, for smelts, uh, the golden rule is about a six-inch drop, 15 centimeter uh, drop for smelts. Uh, and we, in this particular case, you see in the screen here, there are, I think there are five actual ripple structures at this old dam site, and each one of those is about, oh, I think seven inches or so, and uh, the smelts are able to negotiate that. So my, my, usually my golden rule is 15 centimeters, six inches is probably a pretty good indication of how much of a drop between each of the ripple structures. How far apart their space depends uh, a lot on the, on the slope of the stream, because if you go down too far, then you've lost all your elevation, and uh, then you then you ended up, you know, you end up building, instead of five ripples, you end up building 15. Uh, so uh, it really depends on the slope. Um, I had, I don't think I've, I think the one culvert on PEI, I think I built five of them, uh, and it, uh, it was a fairly steep, uh, steep structure. But if it's not steep, uh, then you might get away with just two or three of them. So it's really based on the slope of the stream and how much room you have, uh, have to work with uh, below, the, below the culvert. And, uh, yeah. Uh, so the last part of that question was, how many centimeters of water do smelt need to negotiate a culvert or riffle? Uh, so you're talking about the, the well, the, the six-inch drop is uh, between riffles, I think is sufficient for smelts to get up through. With respect to depth, if the question is what, what the depth in the culvert is, uh, the water itself, um, you yeah. know, you should have at least six inches of uh, depth in the culvert and also to allow for fish passes up to the culvert. Okay, the next is a comment from David Cody. He says, at some point you may be able to abandon the in-stream trap just the same as the bypass pond. True, that's right, but uh, the in-stream, but the, that's right, you can, you can abandon it and you still have sediment, uh, a lot of sediment in, in the system. That's actually that's actually in the bottom of the uh, bottom of the stream. Is that productive? I mean, uh, versus a rocky. You really want a rocky substrate uh, in the bottom of the stream as opposed to a silty, uh, sandy substrate. You're right. You, you can you can abandon it, uh, but um, uh, often when you build these in-stream ones, at least the ones that we were building years ago, they were often wider than the stream itself. So you're actually infringing on the actual banks of the stream and making the, uh, the sedimentation wider than the stream. If you don't do that, if you just build 
within the confines of the uh, of the stream itself. You don't infringe on the banks, and you build a long uh, sediment basin. Yeah, that could work. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're, what do you face with? You, you face with a long stretch of, uh, you know, very fine sediment as a substrate, as opposed to a rocky substrate, which is more amenable to, uh, to the fish that we uh, that we see here. And second, and 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 it's hard to get a, I tell you, hard to get a permit uh, today from uh, uh, from the regulators uh, to dig in streams, and they're 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 really sort of digging their heels in. And uh, that, you know, on PEI, they're more amenable to. Uh, to the bypass ones because you're not really infringing on the stream itself uh, and uh, often you can get a bypass one through the regulatory process so easier than the in-stream one. Okay, next question is from Rachel Jones. She asks, do you have an issue with temperature increase in the bypass sediment ponds? Well, there would be, you know, I think it would be minute uh, considering the size of the, uh, the sediment, sediment pond. I think there would be, uh, there would be a measurable increase uh, not a big issue in PEI uh, because we have such a high base flow of groundwater. And I mentioned before, 60 plus percent of the water uh, in the river is actually groundwater it comes out of the ground at seven degrees. So the, our rivers tend to be very cold anyway. Uh, but having said that, if you you know if you're in other parts of uh, Atlantic Canada where you've got a temperature problem, then yes, uh, by opening up uh, a bypass pond. Uh, then and, you know, to uh, exposing that water to the sunlight, you could get an increase in, in temperature. You'd have, but you'd have to gauge that uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, on, based on what your temperature profile is on, on the stream before you begin. Carolee McCaskill asks, "How do you deal with culvert replacement issues on private properties, farmers' field crossings, and such?" Yeah, and I talked about that earlier, and that's that's the more problematic one because uh, it uh, often resources is a problem that the farmers often will say yes you can go ahead and, and replace my uh, my culvert but uh, you know I don't have any money to uh, to contribute I'll just put this 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 is a private crossing here on, on the right side here and and uh, you know often you have to uh, approach the uh, the landowner gingerly and say listen you've got a problem there with fish passage um, uh, can we uh, perhaps work together in, in, in getting that resolved. So you've got to come up with the resources, and, uh, and that's not always easy, but we've, we've been success, successful in the past in finding some resources here and there. Sometimes you can get used culverts uh, from the Department of Transportation that have been taken out of other areas that are uh, perhaps big enough to, uh, to fit into this spot so you can talk to transportation. Sometimes you can uh, employ the uh, farmer landowner to use his or her heavy equipment to move some of the stuff. There's a, some in-kind contribution uh, perhaps could be used uh, on any application for funding. You can say the farmer is, is able to provide this much in-kind support by way of heavy machinery, uh, and so you've got a partnership now. Um, but uh, often, often, you know, it's, if you go in and you demand uh, that the, uh, the landowner resolve the fish passage on, uh, on his or her own, it's not going to happen. The best approach is, to, is, is the partnership approach, and, and you try to, often you have to scrounge materials and, uh, and you know, come up with three or four partners, and we've been successful in, in that manner. We've actually used culverts that were perhaps hauled out of uh, other you know, government road uh, road projects. And often they, they store these culverts, these old used culverts in, in a yard somewhere. We can scrounge those and use those and put them in place and, and pinch pennies and get some in-kind support. And they were able to pull it off uh, by, uh, by working together. Jackie Bourgeois asks, for bypass pond placement, how many kilometers of stream clearing could you do to accommodate each bypass pond? For example, for every 20 kilometers of stream clearing, should you put a bypass pond to collect the sediment? Could it be more kilometers or less kilometers? Is it determined by how much silt is in a particular section of stream? And that's, yeah, the, the, her last question is, is the correct question, is how much sediment is in the stream? Um, you know. If we look at that PEI, this is an extraordinary uh, problem where we have uh, 50 years of bed load that's been accumulating uh, in our streams, and it's not uncommon to walk into a small stream that may be three or four meters wide and have, you know, two or three feet of silt covering up uh, the sediment. So you really have to gauge uh, how much sediment is expected to be mobile after you do your work and then size uh, and locate 
your sediment bypass uh, basins based on that. So the number of basins, where they're placed, is really really a, a function of how much uh, sediment load you have and how much you expect to uh, or want to trap. Okay, next we have a comment from Rick Simpson. He says, undertaking riparian and or stream in-stream restoration work will typically involve people from several different disciplines practicing their discipline. Um, he says, partnerships work here too, especially if First Nations are one of the partners, preferably if First Nations are the lead proponent. He says that um, as a volunteer, he's had to learn from many different professional uh, languages. For example, whoever heard of a fluvial geomorphologist 25 years ago? Laugh out loud. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you in that one. It's actually, I didn't know what a, a fluvial geomorphologist was until, you know, taking some some courses from Newberry back in the, boy, it would have been the uh, 90s, I guess. Uh, so it's a lot more complicated today, really, than it was 20 years ago, because we know more today than we did 20 years ago. And in a lot of cases, you, you need to have, you know, it's, it's just not enough to walk in there and start clearing brush out without doing some sort of, reconnaissance and, and, and planning, and that may involve sometimes uh, an hydrologist or somebody with some training in that field to make sure that you're making the right decision with respect to your restoration work. So it's, it, it is more complicated today than it used to be, but uh, it seems that the more we know, the more we don't know. Uh, Carolee McCaffrey asks, when do bankful events usually happen around PEI? The bankful events usually, it's, it's, a, it's usually, uh, oh, it's spring spring flow, so we get a, you get a, uh, a rain or a snow covered uh, province, and uh, and that thankful usually occurs. It usually occurs at least once a year, almost once a year, and that's usually in the springtime. So those it is those events that actually really move sediment, and, uh, and they really they really actually dictate the uh, the nature of a stream. So your pools are are being created during the bankful event. Uh, well, banks are being eroded, uh, but mostly during the bankful event, uh, and all that fine sediment that uh, that you're dealing with, that the, due to your stream clearing uh, efforts uh, the summer before, uh, moves uh, during that bankful event. So uh, it happens usually roughly about once a year in the springtime, but it can happen uh, because of climate change. Uh, we're seeing it more often. As I mentioned earlier, that the, you know these culverts were designed to take a one in fifty year rain event. Well, you know, forty years ago, a one in fifty year rain event is now happening about one year in five, and a one in five year rain event is happening about one in two. So with climate change, uh, we're seeing more bankful events, and actually, uh, as I mentioned, we we witnessed a one in hundred year event uh, last year here in PEI where we had uh, warm rain over a snow, and I, I, I've never seen the, the, the river so high. So uh, although it used to be during spring, uh, springtime, during spring melt, you can have uh, bankful events uh, throughout the summer if you have got the heavy, heavy rain events. Uh, she also asked, where do you go to design a proper bridge for culver replacement? You know, that's, that's not an easy one. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I thought that would be easy. Now, these bridges that we built here on PEI, the two that I showed you there uh, in the presentation, I, I figured I would just go to part of the forestry uh, and often these forest, you know, I'm from New Brunswick originally and uh, they used to build these forestry bridges to, the, to extract wood uh, from the from the back country and they were they were designed to take heavy machinery and then designed to be so wide and I thought it would be just easy to go and, uh, and do, uh, pick those designs up but uh, it hasn't been easy to actually, to, to actually pick up a, a, a uh, a manual and say, here you go. This is a this is a proper design of the bridge for this particular area. So we kind of we kind of just kind of winged it. We just said, okay, well, what's important here? We have to you know try to make sure that the uh, the bridge abutments are at are at or above bank full uh, to make sure that in high flow they, they're not going to cause any issues with erosion and or uh, and or fish passage. And uh, had an engineer to look at it to make sure that uh, the bridge itself was going to carry. The machinery that it was designed to carry. So it was for a farmer, um, you know, if it was a culvert in place, and the farmer is driving a combine or a, or a potato harvester or, or a tractor. You got to make sure that that, that that the structure is going to be able to carry what he needs to carry to get to his field. So that yeah, that plays into it too. So it really depends on what you want to carry for heavy machinery. Maybe just an ATV, uh, but in a lot of cases it's heavy farm machinery. So often we'll get that. You know, we've got. 
you know, engineers in the Department of Transportation will send them a schematic and say, this is, these are the carrying beams that we're, we're considering to use, and this is the span, uh, what's the load, what's the, what's the, what's, you know, how strong is this bridge, can you carry a certain load, sometimes we'll, uh, we'll employ a, uh, an engineer to that effect. But otherwise, I don't have a manual specifically to point to and say, this is how you build a bridge. Uh, she also asked, what degree of debris removal sediment mobility deserves a bypass trap? Should every large heavy debris removal event in a large watershed area require a bypass sediment trap? Absolutely not. And, and again, it goes back to uh, sediment load. Uh, I've seen you know, lots of uh, streams that have a lot of woody debris. And by the way, woody debris is a good thing. Uh, you know, a lot of the fish species have, uh, you know, trees, trees, trees die, trees fall in the river, branches fall in the water. Uh, and fish have evolved, and insects have evolved to negotiate and, and to deal with it, and, that, and I, often they, provide, they actually diversify the habitat and provide, it's a good thing. The issue is only, usually, is when you have a, uh, on top of that, you have a big sediment load that comes into the system, and, that, and it often gets trapped uh, by this large organic debris uh, because the debris is slowing the water down. So if you go in there, and I've seen areas in New Brunswick where it's ingrown and has large organic debris, but it has no sediment load, and that's not an issue. Uh, so you have to be very careful in, uh, in your efforts to remove that large or any, any woody debris, because often it provides a very important ecological function for the watershed. Uh, it's, only, uh, it's only really when you've uh, got pro problems with, with sediment being trapped in amongst it or in, in behind it. Okay, so one last comment to end our question and answer session. John Gregory comments um, on WFMD. He says, we have our Capital Rivers program where the Institute of Fisheries Management will be holding demonstration events in each of the UK capital cities on the same day, focusing on salmon and eels. Wow, that sounds like a terrific program. Um, so that ends our...